All right, uh, we can go ahead and get started. Well, thank you everyone for joining this morning. Um, it is my great pleasure to welcome Shalong Wang uh, today to give a talk, invited talk at India. Um, he is an assistant professor at um, UC San Diego in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering. He's also affiliated with the Center for Visual Computing and Contextual Robotics um, Institute. He received his PhD in robotics at the, at, Carn at the Carnegie Mellon University. And he is also a recipient of both the Facebook and NVIDIA graduate fellowships during his PhD. Um, he also recently did his po postdoctoral studies at UC Berkeley. And his research um, focuses at the intersection of computer vision and robotics. And he's particularly interested in learning visual representations from videos in a self-supervised manner and to use those representations to guide robots. Um, and with that, he will be presenting today his uh, work on self-supervised learning for perception and action in time. Take it away, Shailon. Okay. Thank you, Shailini. Thank you for the introduction. And um, everyone, feel free to just uh, ask me questions if you have uh, any questions. Um, so I will start. Okay. So over the past few years, uh, we have made significant advances in the field of computer vision. For example, we can detect objects. Even in many cases, the objects are very small, like kites. Not only that, we can predict human, 3D human poses from a single image. However, most of these networks see the world like this. A lot of static images, one by one. But this is not how our world looks like. Our, our world around us is not static. The world around us looks more like this. Our world is rich, is dynamic and continuous. And this dynamic nature and continuity help us a lot in visual understanding and even training deep networks. Oh, but of course, I'm not the first person who has looked into videos. Researchers in computer vision have been looking into videos for years, if not decades. A lot of research has been done in video understanding, specifically in action recognition. So given a video, we learn the representation to say this is jumping, this is drinking, and so on. To do so, researchers have labeled hundreds of thousands of video. However, representing a video from a single label is wasting away a lot of information. Moreover, when it comes when it comes to more difficult tasks, it is very difficult to obtain human labels. For example, in video segmentation, one of the most popular data set there is only contains 150 videos. For dexterous manipulation, the scale is even smaller. The existing public data set captured by VR only contains 25 demonstrations for opening a door. Learning from human annotations also faces the problem of generalization. It is well known that when transferring a classifier trained with images to videos, there will be a large performance drop. So instead of using human supervision, my research focuses on exploring the con continuity in videos to obtain training signals. Because we obtain a signal from the data itself, we call this self-supervision. We look, let's look at the video of this dog jumping into the water. Because we know that the video is continuous. The dog in the first frame um, should also appear in another frame within a short time. Even the dog it disappears in the middle, it appears again immediately. So the fact that the objects continue to exist in a short time is psychology. It is called object permanence. And this act can actually be a constraint telling us the pixels corresponding to each other over men. Um, there are pixels that are corresponding to each other over all these frames. So in this talk, I will first talk about how to learn correspondence from videos without any human supervision. Finding the correspondence means finding where each pixel or patch goes from one image to another. Um, besides using self-supervision in training time, since we can obtain the supervision all the time, we can even apply self-supervised learning during test time. I will introduce our work 
on test time training, where we can continuously train our model as time goes by in testing using self-supervision. And besides uh, performing self-supervised learning from videos, I will also talk about our recent work towards using videos to supervise robot hand manipulation. So in a short summary, in this talk, I will talk about three works. Um, the first one is uh, try to learn correspondence in time. And then I will talk about test time training. And finally, uh, imitation learning for dexterous manipulation. So I will start, start with the first part on learning correspondence from the cycle consistency of time. Given the video of a sequence of observations, our goal here is to learn visual correspondence without any human supervision and without using any labels. We want to learn where each pixel goes from one thing to another. A range of prior work has used temporal structure in videos to obtain self supervision for learning visual representations. Um, this includes predicting color in time, predicting the pixel in time, and predicting the arrow of time. Most related to us is our old work, actually, that uses training to learn representations that capture visual similarity. We can use off the shelf tracker to provide examples for visual metric learning. Uh, more specifically, we can force the network to learn to have similar representations for these two patches from the same track. And the representation should also be different from other random patches from other videos. Um, similar, similar kinds of metric learning is also uh, being very popular right now, which is called contrast learning. So the problem is that um, in this work, is that tracking is actually very difficult. So this work ends up um, being limited by the weakness of the, of the shelf trackers they rely on. So uh, we have seen that learning feature requires a good tracker to provide data for learning, but a tracker requires good features for learning finding correspondences. So lesson, let's learn that both jointly. Um, suppose we have a deep tracker um, F. Given the patch in the last frame, we can first perform tracking in time with the lagward F. But where can we find the supervision to train such a tracker? Given the tracking results in the first frame, um, the bounding box in the first frame, we apply the same tracker to perform forward tracking back to the future. The inconsistency between the initial patch and the final tracking results provides an error for supervision. So we can use this error to back propagate along the cycle to improve our presentation and the tracker F. So let's see how each step of tracking actually works. Given the patch and the image, we first extract the diff features for both two images. We need to learn the visual representation, which allows matching in feature, the matching between these two images in feature space. We can see these features as lower resolution images and use them as input for a spatial transformer network. The spatial transformer network will output the XY location, which find, uh, which indicating where the patch should be inside this image. Given this location, we can then crop the feature out of the image feature according um, to this um, predicted location. And this feature um, is PT minus one, corresponding to the tracking result. Note that this procedure is also differentiable. So we can present the whole process as the function F, which is a differentiable function. And because we know that um, it is a differentiable process, and the input and output patch feature are in the same dimension. So we can perform this process recurrently. We can first going backward in time to t time t minus three, and then going forward to, time, to the frame in time t. We can then compute the difference between the initial patch and the tracking result to provide a cycle consistency loss function. More specifically, 
um, the log the loss function here is very a very simple L2 distance um, of the location in the initial patch and the final tracking result. So the blue box here represents the initial location and the red box here represents the tracking result. Um, besides the long cycles, we are also designed times of cycles. For example, the shorter cycles here uh, provide easier tasks, which support learning at the beginning of training when the feature is not very stable. Uh, sometimes correspondence is also impossible due to occlusions. So we can also decide cycles that can skip frames to address this, thing, uh, this issue. So during training, we combine all different cycles together. Um, here is a visualization of one cycle uh, during different iterations of training. We can see that as the cycle becomes more and more uh, consistent, the tracking results gets better and better and better. So at test time, we only keep the learned representation. We only keep the feature and use it to measure correspondence with uh, a simple layers labor. Given two frames in the video, we first extract features for each frame. We then compute the similarity between every pair of pixels across feature maps. So here is ex an example of computing the similarity between one pixel in time t minus one and all the pixels in time t. At test time, um, so we can then select the most similar pair as the correspondence. And given the labels in time t minus one, we can propagate the labels to the next frame according to this correspondence. Um, here is an example of tracking object masks given the labels of the first frame. Note that we didn't do any fine tuning um, in this Davis data set. We just used our pre-trained feature to find nearest labels. And here is the examples of post tracking. So this is a more challenging task because we need to know exactly where each pixel goes and where each point goes. Uh, we evaluate the accuracy of post tracking comparing to the ground truth. Um, our method outperforms previous methods, including self-supervised learning with video conversation. Um, to visualize if we have really learning dense correspondence, um, we can actually paint the first frame with a rainbow texture and propagate the texture to the following frames like this. So although the pose of the dog changes a lot, uh, we can still keep tracking the eyes of the dog. Uh, more surprisingly, our representation works even when tracking a whole minute of video. Um, remember, all these results without, is without using any human supervision in training time. And then we, are, we can learn very generic representation from just unlabeled data itself. There are also some uh, um, extensions of our work. Um, so this is one work that actually is uh, done collaborating with NVIDIA which combines video colorization together uh, with our cycle consistency loss. There is also a recent work that uh, combines contrasted learning with cycle consistency loss. Um, so we can see that over this one year, um, there has been a lot of improvement in tracking and label propagation with self-supervised um, learning. And it is actually getting very close to uh, supervised learning results. Um, our work here is also related to uh, one of our earlier work on the local real networks, where we use long range correspondence across frames to help to understand human action. So, for example, if we can connect the ball in the first frame to the following frames, uh, you, it will help to understand um, the boy is kicking the ball. This shows um, the self supervised learning might also have the potential to improve uh, video classification tasks. Um, so, um, any questions so far? So, I have a question, Shalom. So, okay. um, so this, this uh, makes I can, I... Sorry, can you hear me? Uh, yes, yes. Yeah, so my question is, how much of an issue is um, the network learning degenerate solutions while you're training it to, um, you know, learn from these cycles? Does that happen frequently? And, and how, what are some 
practical ways to overcome. Oh, what 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 was the? I, I didn't catch the first one. So, is how much of a problem is the fact that the network can learn degenerate solutions while degenerate solutions the like, like so, for example, identity or just not learn anything. You know, do you encounter that when you train with this cycle? Um, by not learning anything, uh, what do you mean by not learning anything? Um, so, for for example, it just learns an identity. So it just oh, takes okay. x y from one pixel location yeah. and and just copies it in the next and so on. And so yeah, it's, yeah. So how much of that problem happens, and how do you? What are some practical solutions to overcome that? Um. So I think um uh, the the question is like um maybe uh given the first patch uh you you can just keep uh, in the in the following frames you can just maintain the location and then coming back with the same location exactly that's exactly uh, so, right yeah yeah so so um so we avoid that by we are actually not taking the whole image as input as the uh, for the first query query uh we are actually cropping the patch out uh from the image so the patch itself actually does not have any context information and it does not have uh, any location information it doesn't know where it is originally inside the image so it needs actually to find um uh, the right patch to track going back to the images so if it is you provide the context maybe the padding of the image and the how much how long from the boundary can give you a sense on how the uh, where the patch is inside the image but if you remove the context uh, it's just a patch so um, it, it has to do the tracking to going back to the right location. Um, I think the, the same thing uh, also apply is apply in um, this recent work in the in the uh, space time correspondence with a contrasted random work paper. Um, they also basically do just uh, cropping dense patches and then do uh, this uh, tracking. Um, and then same thing happens in CPC. Basically, you crop only patch, not the entire. Uh, image. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So I have talked about uh, our first work in self supervised learning in the training phrase. Um, but because we can actually keep um, the self supervised learning does not require human to to uh, to get the labels. So we can actually keep using the learning even during test time. Um, so the lecture work I want to present here is test time training. So in this work, uh, we are trying to tackle the problem of distribution shift between training and testing distribution. The fundamental assumption in supervised learning here um, is that we have um, the same distribution for training and testing denoted here as distribution P and Q respectively. But in the real world, uh, this is almost never the case. And when P and Q are different, we say that there are distribution shifts, which can cause performance drops. So you can train on killing for images and text on blur ones. You can train a face detector, but it's not working because everyone is wearing a mask. And worst of all, you are often not even able to tell what the distribution shifts are. So here is a popular data set called CIVA 10. And last year, researchers make their best efforts to collect a new test set for it. Humans cannot tell any difference between these two test sets, but the performance of the neural network drops significantly. So over the past decade, people have realized how important and challenging the distribution shifts are and have come up with a few paradigms to solve it. So the first one is called domain adaptation. And it assumes to some, it assumes it has access some samples from the test distribution distribution during training time. The problem, of course, is that even though these uh, additional samples could be unable, it is hard to know the test distribution ahead of time, not to mention sampling from it. The next paradigm is called domain generalization, assumes access to data from a meta distribution. So here is the same old um, uh, basically diagrammed, and we can com convert it to a graphical model on the right like this. Now, domain generalizations assumes some additional structure to this graphical model, 
and it looks like this. With this structure, we can again treat training and test, testing distributions as IID samples from the meta distribution M higher up in the hierarchy. So we assume that if we can train on distribution P1 to Pn, then our model can generalize to distribution Q. That's what um, domain generalization assumes. But this merely passes the fundamental problem of the distribution shifts along to a level higher up. So it used to be hard to know the test distribution. Now it is hard to know the meta distribution that generates the test dis the distribution. So in other words, we have just traded distribution shifts for meta distribution shifts without really addressing the problem. So in summary, the existing paradigms anticipate the distribution shifts in various ways. Uh, which is really difficult and impractical in real-world application. And the further you want to anticipate about the future, the complexity of the problem grows exponentially. So we propose to tackle the problem of distribution shifts with test time training, which does not anticipate the distri test dist distribution during training time. Let's start with the standard definition of test error which concretely translates to drawing a sample X from Q, making a prediction on X using the train model theta, then evaluating the prediction with a loss function L. We notice that the test sample X itself gives us a hint of our distribution Q, which is the unknown test distribution for our training. So we can, in fact, modify theta during testing by taking advantage of this hint. So this translates to, translates to our modified test error here. Within the expectation, the theta is adapted using the sample X that makes a prediction only on this sample. That is, we no longer have a fixed model at test time. So we modify theta by setting up a one sample learning problem using only X, the input, but not the wider label, since we don't get to see why during test time. So how do we train the theta? In here, uh, we use self-supervision. The self-supervised task we are using here is the image rotation uh, prediction task. Uh, given an image input, we rotate it by multiples of 90 degrees and label each one of these four images accordingly. So this produces a four-way classification problem that we can then ask a convolutional neural network to solve. So the goal of this self-supervised task is not to do well in rotation prediction itself, but to obtain good feature representations that can tell which way the beak of the bird is pointing. These are the kinds of features that are important for many tasks in computer vision. So people usually use self-supervision as a pre-training step, uh, what they do is that the library, the library architecture can be artificially divided into a feature extractor and then a self-supervised learning head, theta s. So after training with self-supervision, theta s is then discarded. We then take only the feature extract extractor, theta e, and use it for a downstream main task, usually by putting a main task head, theta m, on top of the theta e. So it's the following standard um, pre-training and fine-tuning step. So now our work here use, uses self-provision slightly differently. And our network architecture has actually two heads, both theta s and theta m. So during training time, given an input image from the distribution p, our main task head here tries to predict the label, the semantic label, for, uh, which leads to the main task loss. We can also use self-supervision to make up labels and predict those. So we can rotate image to different degrees and ask the network to predict whether it is 90 degree, 180 degree, or 270 degree. So this leads to a self-supervised uh, classification loss. We add these two losses together in training time and minimize them to overall training samples 
in order to approximately minimize this expectation of a P here. We call this joint chaining of both the main task and the self supplies task. Now here comes the important part. What happens at test time? So a test examples comes, comes in from Q, like this bird here corrupted by motion blur. Because this image comes with no label, there's nothing we can learn from the main task head. But we can still make up labels with self-supervision and get feedback that concerns theta s, and very critically, also the backbone theta e, the shell feature extractor. So at test times, we try to minimize the self-supervised loss, and in the process, improving the theta e, making theta e more adapt to the test example. And because um, the theta e is sharing also um, between the self supervised task and the main task. So improving the theta E, you can also improve the main task at the same time. And because X is drawn from the distribution Q, we can kind of see this as approximating the expected loss over the Q distribution. But I'm going to put this expectation sign in gray here because our one sample unbiased approximation has extremely high variance. So um, we can solve this optimization problem with gradient descent, and the solution here, and the solution is the updated theta x. We then use it to make a prediction on this after this um, gradient descent test. So let's take a break and look at an example. So here is an elephant, and the x-axis here um, is the number of gradient steps taken at test time. For the test time optimization problem on the left, the y-axis here is the predicted likelihood of the label given this image and the model. I'm only plotting the top three classes, elephant, dog, and cattle. In iteration zero, during test time training, the model predicts higher probability um, for dog than elephant in the very beginning, which is incorrect. But as the test time training um, is applied through time, the elephant likelihood rises and our prediction becomes correct after a few iterations. Eventually, the elephant converges to winning by a large margin. Um, so any questions so far? Um, hi, um, may I ask a quick question? Okay. Um, so is there any uh, theoretical justification that uh, enforcing this consistency actually solves the distribution shift? Um, so um, there, also, there is a small theoretical um, proof in the, in the paper. So uh, what we have proved is that if the gradient of the self-supervised task and the main task is um, more aligned, then uh, it's very it's more likely that improving one task in test time can improve another task. Uh, but then um, this proof is in the very right and, and make a lot of assumptions on um, like this is a linear model. Um, but then um, it's also very hard to ensure that the two gradients and can actually align in training time. So, um, but this is. Uh, just given more like the intuition that uh, if we have two tasks that are more close to each other, and then improving one task will be very likely to improve a lot of tasks during this test time training. And we actually show a lot of experiments in the um, in, in the following work. Um, that is the case. Got it. Thanks. I have another question. Okay. Is there any chance that uh, after fine tuning theta e, so theta e just uh, learn only the direction information during test time? In the direction of what? So again. So, uh, so you you were saying that you uh, you will uh, fine tune theta e during test time, right? Yeah. So is there any chance that after fine tuning theta e just extract the direction information of the image and ignore everything else? Oh, so, so I think um, your task will be like uh, your your question is like uh, saying 
uh, will theta e overfit to the self supervised task and forget about the main task. And then yeah. um, um, the main task had, does not recognize the feature of the self supervised task uh, of the yeah. theta e anymore. So, um, yeah, so that's a very concern. Um, so we didn't do anything to explicitly stop it doing that. Um, there's no bound and anything like make sure it doesn't do that. Uh, we just see in practice uh, this does not happen um, a lot. So so this was the worry in the beginning, and we tried to design something to like um, keep on some distillation or uh, adding the training um, examples um, together in during test time training. Um, but we find that they are those are not necessary. So in the experiments, uh, in um, like I'm going to talk about. So there are also cases that like we just keep fine tuning the example one by one through whole data set using the self supervised task and still keep improving the main task. Um, so it's not forgetting um, on the main task. Um, yeah. Thank you. Hi, uh, yeah, so uh, what exactly is a self-supervised task for this uh, elephant uh, and dog uh, scenario? Yeah, so so the self-supervised task here is um, you rotate an image and then you put the rotate image as input for the legwork and you ask the legwork to estimate um, like which rotation you apply. So we uh, we provide four types of rotation here and then you, you basically do a four class um, classification on saying estimating which lo rotation it is applied on this image. Does this answer your question? Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah, so um, actually most of self supervised tasks can also be seen as you apply some transformation on top of the image and then you input the transform image into the legwork. You ask the legwork to estimate what transformation you have applied on the input image. Um, so one direction we have think of for this work is if you can also learn the self supervised task, that can you also learn a legwork to provide this transformation? Um, that would be also cool. But um, uh, this is um, still some just some thoughts. We haven't done anything in that direction yet. Okay. Um, so we can move forward. Okay, so uh, now this the break is over. Um, let's see what happens with multiple test samples. Um, so let's denote a data set with t examples as x1 to xt, and the model parameters after training time is theta zero. And if we do not make any assumption that how the test examples have anything to do with each other, we will initialize the test time optimization problem with theta zero for all test samples. So you basically, um, you would update the model and then you discard the update and then you go for another uh, example and you train from the theta zero again. So um, so this simple single image training, we call it the standard version of this test time training. So um, besides the standard version, if we make the additional assumption that the test samples arrive one by one in a stream like a video from the same distribution queue. Then we have the online version. So the optimization problem for X1 is initialized to be theta zero, and the solution is called theta one, which we then use to initialize for that of X2 and so on. So this concludes um, our approach part. Let's see some results. Um, so we have performed um, experiments on multiple different recognition um, um, tasks. The first benchmark is object recognition on images with diverse corruptions. This includes various noise of type, noise types, um, different kinds of blurring and weather conditions and imaging artifacts. Um, those corruptions are added to the test set of CIFAR 10 and ImageNet. And the new test sets are called CIFAR 10C and image lag C, um, C represents corruption, respectively. So critically, we assume no knowledge of the cor corruption during training. So we don't know what kind of corruption is applied um, in the test set. So here are some results on CIFAR 10C. 
we are measuring the testing error here. The leftmost blue bars are from a liquid train with only the main task for object recognition. The yellow bars are for the mixed model immediately after joint training. We would, which we will have been calling this is a theta zero. The green bars are for test time training standard version, which improves upon the blue and yellow baselines. And finally, the orange bars are for the online version, which makes the extra assumption of the test data stream is from the same distribution and achieves a, a large improvement. So um, here are the same kind of results in image SC. So exact that we now report accuracy because um, the error is very low in this um, data set. Uh, the, because it's very difficult and the error is very high in this data set. Um, so you can see that in if you apply Gaussian noise in test time, uh, the performance of the original recognition model almost dropped to 2% and 5%-ish. And applying our uh, test time training online method, it actually improves the performance a lot. Um, so here, here's the slides that visualize the online version results for the uh, original training distribution and the corruption typed in previous slides. So there are 50k test samples in the image lab test set, and the x-axis counts the number of samples um, the online version has seen. On the five different um, corruption distributions, the accuracy improves as more samples are evaluated on because the online version collects information along the way about the corruption shared among uh, samples, even though it has never seen any of these labels. So we can see that just keep fine tuning the self support loss. Um, it can still keep adapting the model to the data over all the training examples, and it's not forgetting about the main task. The performance is still keep improving over time. So we also compare our approach with unsupervised domain adaptation. Uh, unsupervised domain adaptation methods um, is very similar to our approach in Spirit, uh, but the difference is that it assumes it see the um, testing data distribution even during training time, uh, even without using any labels. So to train with the unlabeled data from the test distribution uh, in the unsupervised domain adaptation setting, we use the self supervised task. So when an image is coming from the um, test distribution, we train with the self supervised task. When the image is coming from the training distribution, we train from with both tasks. Um, that's the general idea of the unsupervised domain adaptation approach. So uh, we will assume that um, this kind of approach should be the upper bound of our method um, because you already see the test distribution, you optimize both distribution together. But in fact, um, we, we have seen that it's actually not the case. So it turns out memorizing the test data distribution together with the training data distribution is not as good as directly just um, forget about the training distribution and overfit our method to the testing data using our approach here. So in here, we can see that we are reporting the test error, and in most cases, uh, test time training is actually uh, better than unsupervised domain adaptation, which sees the testing the distribution during training time. Um, so the second benchmark here is, um, trains an uh, object recognition model on still images from CIFAR 10 and image led and tests on videos. The videos record objects in motion and are labeled with the class of the object. So our results is uh, in accuracy are shown in the table on the left. On the right side, we randomly sublet some positive samples here, uh, showing test time training can convert the wrong prediction results, which is the red one, to the correct prediction results, which is in blue, including the elephant we have shown earlier. The positive examples are nice, but I think the most interesting one are the negative examples. So here are some examples where test time training, in fact, hurts. So for me, this Images are actually rotation invariant. So no matter how you rotate this image, it actually looks still correct on these three examples. So in order for test time training to make meaningful updates, the self-supervised task 
uh, which is the rotation prediction here in our case, must be well defined. And all these negative examples violate this assumption. And in fact, there is a class by class breakdown of accuracy in our paper. And we find that results really suffer for one particular category. Um, that is the airplanes. Um, because no matter how you rotate this airplane image, um, the lab work uh, is still a reasonable uh, input. And there's no way the lab work can tell uh, where, where this, the lab work, how many rotation degrees this has been rotating. So it speaks about the limitation of the rotation prediction task. And this could be addressed by trying to other self supervised the learning task as well. And finally, the last benchmark is called CFAT 10.1. It's a new test set for CFAT 10 where humans cannot notice the distribution shifts. But the networks trained on CFAT 10 suffers a large performance drop. While the baseline approach can have a test error less than 8% easily in CFAT 10, the test error on CFAT 10.1 becomes 17%. So there's almost a 10% drop because of this distribution shift. Although still far from solving the problem, applying test time training still makes an improvement on this uh, training gene benchmark. Okay, um, that's the, the, um, the experiment part of this paper. Um, are there any questions? Okay, um, I will continue. So um, I've introduced the online version of test time training in the last word on image classification. Uh, we further extend this work on using test time training in an online learning setting for visual-based reinforcement learning. So um, this is an example of couple in visual-based reinforcement learning. A card can move along a friction track, and the goal is to control the card so that the stick on top will not fall down. So uh, in this task, we need to train a policy which takes a few frames as input. Uh, capturing the current state and output the action. The agent will, in, will then interact with the environment using the action and generate the lag frame, which is then used as the input for the policy again to predict the lag action. So we can do it this recurrently. Um, while we can train a policy easily to work in a certain environment, it is very hard to generalize the RL policy to unseen environments during testing. So we can see that example on the right here is a completely fail. So how do we adapt a reinforcement learning policy to test time? So in RL, we can first observe images as inputs, predict the action, and obtain the reward from the action. And then we use the reward to update the policy. However, during deploying, deployment or during test time, the reward is not available. Instead of using reward to update the policy um, following the test time training work, we here can use the self supervised learning task to update the policy. So our lag work is also, um, the pipeline is also very similar. We basically in here decide self supervised task um, to perform joint training with the RL task. Um, instead of using the rotation task here, the self supervised task here is defined as training an inverse dynamics model. Which, which takes in the current state ST and previous state ST minus one and predicts the action AT minus one ticking after the previous state. Um, to be more specific, uh, to train the inverse dynamics model, given the state and action, we can obtain um, the lag state from the environment. And then the inverse dynamics model um, takes the in both the states as input and estimate the action in between. The last function here is basically simply the L2 distance between the, um, the predicted action and the, you, the input action into the environment. So, and the policy on the other hand, takes in the current state and the, pre the previous states as input and that predicts action AT. That needs to be taken in the current state. So we can see that these two tasks are presented in a very similar format. And we find that um, in this case, improving the inverse dynamics model um, uh, task can actually help a lot in the policy estimation task. Um, so during test time is a similar regime 
that we basically, when new observations are taking as the agents are moving, we can keep updating the policy using the self supervised task as we see new frames um, appears. So in our experiment, we change our region uh, agent, for example, Walker agent in a fixed environment on the left and test the agent in a completely different environment on the right. So in this task, the goal of the walker is to run towards to the right side as fast as possible. Um, so there are more um, different testing environments we have shown here. So we compared our methods uh, with different baselines. So there is um, our baseline is SAC plus inverse dynamics model, uh, the joint training of SAC and inverse dynamics model. And then CUR is basically joint training of SAC and contrasted learning, which is also recently proposed. And then and adding this PAD is basically, we try to do test time adaptation, adapting during the deployment using um, fine tuning the inverse dynamics model. And we can see that um, by training on the leftmost environment and then tests on the right environment, um, the middle two methods without test time training actually fail. Um, but using our uh, test time training and our policy adaptation during test time on the rightmost examples, uh, we can slowly adapt to the environment and um, finish the task. And here is a more example. Basically, uh, we try to um, make the background actually becomes a video. And we can see that the middle two baselines without, um, without the um, adaptation, um, the agent is destructed a lot. Um, but our method keep continuously update and then adapt to the environment as the background changes. And here is an, another example on half cheetah uh, walking to the right. So the goal is um, you want to walk to the right side as far as possible. And you can see that the agents in the middle two cases stuck a lot. In our case, uh, we can just keep moving to the right. <clears throat> and here is another example on walker. Okay, um, and then um, besides um, besides updating agent policy in a, a string of this simulated data, we uh, we can also apply our methods in the real world video string of data. So here is example that um, we are currently doing. Uh, we are running an object detector that is trained from the BDD data set, the driving data set on the webcam. Uh, and then we use our test time training method to perform adaptation and make the detector continuously update over time. So we can see this is video taking like 6 p.m. ish. So um, the sun actually going down and then there's a continuous changing of the environment. And then we, we can also basically adapt our model continuously as the, um, the sun is going down. And then um, this is one potential future application of our method. Okay, um, any questions? <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, so then um, I will go to the, my, the final work. So we have been um, talking about using self-supervised learning um, during training and testing with videos. Um, so can we also use of videos to supervise the uh, robot learning. So in this work, I want to talk about um, one of our recent work on uh, state-only imitation learning for dexterous manipulation. So the dexterous manipulation with multiple finger hands has the potential to equip robots with human-like flexibility and thus enable them to perform a wide range of tasks. However, the gen gen generality comes at a specific cause of complex high dimension action spaces. Recently, we have witnessed uh, promising results in using model reinforcement learning for dexterous man manipulation. And however, these methods suffer from a poor sample compl complexity. So one way to overcome this issue is to perform imitation learning. In particular, leveraging uh, demonstrations of humans performing the same of related tasks and, to, and then to learn to perform the task quicker for the robot. But this general paradigm involves many challenges that we must address. For example, uh, we do not have access to the demonstrator actions. The demonstrator 
and the learner may have very different morphologies and different dynamics and so on. Um, there has been a considerable progress towards this goal in imitation learning. In, in particular, a large body of work has focused on the setting uh, where demonstrations come in the front of state action pairs. Typically, we can uh, do some recording in VR setups. However, collecting the data in this setup is very challenging. So in this work, uh, we try to move a step further toward the goal of exploring um, state-only imitation learning. So in here, uh, the demonstrations contain only state without the actions. Um, without the actions, we cannot do behavior cloning and supervised learning from the demonstrations. But this setting has two main benefits. First, it reduces the data collection cost by allowing potential usage of video, uh, human videos as demonstrations. For example, here, uh, in this case, this is uh, my hand rotating a pen. And then whether this can provide some clues um, to help robot to rotate a pen, that's what we hope for, hope to see. And then second, it allows leveraging demonstrations from different but related set, uh, settings. So we can learn from manipulation demonstrations with different dynamics, um, methodologies, and objects. So to tackle this setting, we propose a simple um, effective approach based on the idea of action prediction. So we want to fill up the action between every two states in the demonstration since it's not provided. In particular, we train again an inverse dynamics model to predict actions between consecutive states. So the way to train the inverse dynamics is similar as I mentioned before. You basically uh, collect data with state actions, state triplets, and then you can train the model using two states as input and the action as output. And given the predicting actions, we can incorporate them into an overall objective, uh, combining imitation learning and reinforcement learning. In this equation, we have a uh, reinforcement learning term and an auxiliary imitation learning term. The training state action pairs are inferred using our inverse dynamics model. In, intuitively, sorry, my cat is here. Intuitively, learning from demonstrations provide a form of exploration strategy. So in here, our uh, imitation learning is using a uh, data set D, uh, D prime. And this in this D prime explains the demonstrations, but the action is inferred by the inverse dynamics model. So uh, in this work, we train the inverse models and the policy jointly in an alternative fashion. So the RL agents will provide um, the we collect trajectories from the policy to uh, train the inverse dynamics model. And the inverse dynamics model we complete the demonstrations using the um sorry, one second. And the inverse dynamics. <laughs> okay, sorry, sorry about that. Um, so basically, we can just um, use the inverse dynamics model to to complete the um, the training data set for reinforcement learning. We find this um, joint training to be an effective way to obtain data, which. <clears throat> Um, we evaluate our method on a suit of different dexterous manipulation tasks. Um, so these tasks include object relocation, pen manipulation, and door opening, and, and using a hammer um, to uh, hit the nail. We perform control, control comparison with pure RL without demonstrations, uh, which is shown in red yellow curve, and the DAPG that uses state action demonstrations uh, which is the blue um, curve. So pure, pure RL can be considered as a lower bound for uh, our method, and then um, DAPG can be considered as upper bound for our method, respectively. So we observed that our method with state-only demonstrations perform on par with D DAPG and considerably outperforms RL alone. Um, so here are some visualizations for different methods in the object relocation task. The goal is to pick up the blue ball to the green location. 
uh, we observe that the state owned policy is more predicted than the POR policy and is comparable to the state action policy. As you can see that if you change with only RL, it is very easy to converge to a strange grasping pose. Um, but using the imitation learning, you can have a very normal human-like grasping. Um, so here are more other tasks we have experiment on. We can rotate a pen, uh, we can open the door, and then we can also using a hammer to hit the nail. So uh, without turn to the generalization experiments, so our experiment setting is as follows. We train to perform the object relocation tasks under different settings using different dynamics, morphologies, and objects. Um, but we only use the original demonstrations. So in these settings with different dynamics, methodologies, and objects, a mimicking the original demonstration actions may not make sense because um, the, um, the, the action and state pair does not fit the dynamics anymore. So the motivation here is to test if our state-only method can actually generalize better than state action approaches. So first we consider different dynamics. We train to perform the task using original demonstrations and the hands of increased mass. So the, the mass of the hands is increasing. We experiment with three settings using eight times larger mass, and then 16 times and 30 times, 22 times. And you can see that, you can feel that the hand is very heavy in the end. Um, we observe that our methods outperforms the state action approach and that the games are larger for harder settings. The reason is that with larger mass, the collected state action demonstrations do not represent the correct dynamics anymore. But our inverse dynamics model, on the other hand, can adapt to the new environment. So next, we also considered training to perform the task using a hand with fewer fingers. So there are two, uh, diff three different settings. We can train with uh, four, um, four fingers, three fingers, and two fingers. So in these settings, we also see that um, our method is better than state action approach. So here is a comparison. So if you train with state action demonstrations uh, with five fingers um, for the two finger task, so the agent cannot actually perform well in grasping, but in our case, we still do reasonable grasp. And here, finally, we also consider a setting with different objects. For example, if we train to relocate um, a banana Using the original four demonstrations, our findings are again consistent here. So we can see that if you train with state action pair, that is um, using demonstration, using picking up the ball, you cannot stably grasp the banana. Um, but in our case, uh, we can still um, um, perfectly grasp this banana. <laughs> okay, as a short summary, so I've talked about. Uh, learning correspondence in time, and then test time training, and then imitation learning for dexterous manipulation. Um, so there are some works I have not introduced um, that I'm also interested in working on right now. Basically, I'm interested in learning object um, dynamics from videos, like seeing how um, how to perform long-term prediction uh, for objects and how to uh, perform this object interaction. And then I'm also interested in learning human dynamics. So basically, uh, here is a video of our recent work on synthesizing long-term human motions. Um, in <clears throat> and then um, besides learning correspondence in the video across videos, I'm also interested in learning correspondence across dynamics. So uh, what does finding correspondence across dynamics mean? So here is an example of a recent experiment we are working on. On the left is an X-arm robot performing a random action in the real world. On the right is a Franca robot performing similar action. So even across different um, robots, we make like the robot of Franca robot to follow actions of XM robot. Um, so, so I'm also interested in um, continuing exploring the test time training approach. Um, so basically how to make the model personalized. So since um, you can actually train individual model on individual um, test examples. So you can also train this model in individual different edge device. So you can personalize this um, methods 
And then um, you can also apply test time training in sim to real. So here's just a simple um, experiment we just started working on. So for the reaching task, the, 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 the arm needs to reach the, the dot on the table. Uh, we, if we directly transfer the policy to the real robot, we just uh, in a slightly different environment. So it would just fail, but using test time training, we can still kind of um, do a reasonable reaching here. <clears throat> and of course, um, so since um, imitation learning is very important, um, so I have just introduced um, one state only imitation method that's still based on the state, not vision. So in future, I will hope to extend our method to basically try to uh, learn, learn from directly human videos. Um, and then uh, more ambitiously, we can also try to learn from intellect scale videos. And here is some examples from the something something data set. So can we actually learn from these videos and help robot to uh, do this um, hand manipulation task? That's, um, that's the end of my talk. Thank you. Um,